bit. Let's begin uh, reading now. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into a certain city and say to him, the teacher uh, says, my time is near and I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus directed them and they prepared the Passover. I just want to stop right here and unpack some things because I got more scriptures to get into in Matthew chapter 26. But unless we really get the historical setting and the significance of the setting, we really begin to miss what begins to unfold in this drama that's taking place on this night. So they are getting ready as good Jewish men. They are celebrating Passover, three main Jewish feast days that Jews needed to return to Jerusalem every year to partake of these feasts. The first and probably most significant one was Passover. And so we say, well, what is Passover? Passover was when hundreds of years ago, the Jewish people settled in Egypt. You know the story, Joseph became second in command of all of Egypt through miraculous undertakings. And then Joseph invited what was only about 70 in number at that time, just the beginning of a nation, the nation of Israel, invited them uh, into Egypt. And then as they grew in Egypt, other pharaohs arose that was, were, they were not down with the whole fact that all these people were there. And so they put them to task. They made slaves out of them. And for 430 years, the Egyptians lorded it over the Israelites and they were slaves. They thought like slaves. They acted like slaves. They didn't have identity. They didn't have purpose. They didn't have hope. They were slaves. They were born into slavery. They lived their lives and they died in the dust of the Egyptian sand as slaves for at least 12 generations so you would sit there and say, my dad, my granddad, my great-granddad were all slaves. My children, my great-children, my great-grandchildren will all be slaves. This is just something that was in the mindset. And after 430 years, you know the story. God gets Moses. Moses goes. The plagues come down. Nine plagues that devastated the land of Egypt. And then the last plague was the death of the firstborn of everything in the regions of Egypt. But to the Israelites, God said, you are to take a lamb that night. You are to slay the lamb, pour its blood in a basin. You're to roast the lamb. You're to have a big meal together. You're to take the blood in that basin. You're to put it on the top of your doors, on the side of your doors, forming a cross. Who would have ever thought thousands of years that something this symbolic was taking place? For on that night, the death angel is going to come into Egypt and slay the firstborn of every household. But when he sees the blood on the door, he will pass over that house judgment will pass over that dwelling place. And so the Jews ate that first Passover that night, put the blood on the doorpost, and the angel came in, and there was tremendous tragedy in all of Egypt, except in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites fled. And that was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Pharaoh let them go, they delivered, they went, and they started a nation. And here it is, literally thousands of years later, uh, and, and here's Jesus, a good Jewish rabbi, with his followers, with his apprentices, and they're having this Passover meal. But we need to understand something that's happening between the reality of history and the reality of an unseen world. Because the reality of history was is that the Jews were enslaved to Egypt for 430 years. God delivered them through this Passover of judgment, and they came out into the promised land. But spiritually, there was another type of slavery that was enslaving not just the Israelites, but the entire human race. And that was a slavery to sin. People didn't understand it. That mankind had fallen, and that sin was rampant, and that sin dwells and resides in every single one of us, and that we are slaves to sin. And because of that, we're born in sin, we live in sin, we die in sin, and then we go into the afterlife. And in sin, the afterlife spells out only one destination, and that is hell. You know, it's amazing that churches nowadays want to be so relevant, they don't want to offend nobody, so they don't talk about what Jesus talked about more than any other person in the entire Bible, and that is this damnable destination, a Christless eternity called hell, where people will go and be in torment forever and ever. As Foss says, you who enter, abandon all hope. There's never any hope. 
Nowadays, even if you get a life sentence in jail, you still have hope that you might get parole. But here, there's no hope. This place of torment, this place of agony, this place of separation from the love of the God that created us. This hell, and this is what Jesus was looking at. Jesus is celebrating Passover in, in commemoration of what took place in the land of Israel, but he's looking at what's really going down. He's looking through the veil, he's looking into a spiritual realm, and he understands that he is the Passover lamb. And this isn't about deliverance from some tyrant or some despot or some wicked nation. This is over the lies of the enemy. This is over the power of sin. This is over Satan's trump card that damns people's souls into a godless hell forever. And Jesus says, let's partake of this Passover. Let's pick it up in verse 20. It says, now when evening came, Jesus reclined at the table with his 12 disciples and they were eating and he said, truly I say to you, that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered and he said, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he is the one that will betray me. The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good if that man had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You've said it yourself. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, Take and eat. This is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said to them, Take and drink from it. Look at the next three words. All of you. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went away to the Mount of Olives. This is an incredible setting. This is the Passover, the, the great Passover, such a famous thing that Leonardo da Vinci himself painted this incredibly famous painting of, of the disciples. And when we think of this Last Supper feast, when we think of this meal of Jesus with his disciples and, and they're all there, we think that Jesus is offering this meal, offering this blessing to all of them. Peter, who was hot and cold, hot and cold, he was just so unstable. James and John, who had anger issues and wanted to call fire down on people who they didn't like. Matthew, who was a, a, a traitor and a rebel and a tax gatherer. Simon the zealot, who, who was just you know a conspiracy theory guy and ready to always rise up in an insurrection. Thomas, the one who just never believed anything. And then, and then this guy right here, Judas, who was the one himself betraying Jesus. One gospel writer says that Jesus looked at Judas and said, what you do, do quickly. And Judas arose and it said, and Satan entered him. Not demon possession, he was Satan possessed. And he went out and betrayed the Lord of glory. You say, what's the point here? The point is, is that Jesus knows these guys. He knows their weaknesses. He knows their blemishes. He knows their frailties. He knows everything about them. He knows their ups, their downs, their in-betweens. And he offers it to all of them. You see, here's the thing. This morning, you might feel unworthy. You might be here this morning and your world is coming apart. You might have wrecked some relationships. You might have trashed some relationships. You might be in a thing where you're lying. You might be in a thing where you're wrestling with an habitual sin. You might have just even fallen yesterday. You might be in an area and you say, you know what? Boy, this is Communion Sunday. I am not worthy to partake of this table. We, we get this idea that we tell ourselves, when I get my act together, I'll present myself to God. That's like saying, when I start feeling better, I'll go to the hospital. Right? I mean, if you had a wheezing and a coughing and a sharp pain in your chest, something probably seriously wrong, you wouldn't sit there and say, <laughs> when I feel a little better, I think I'll go to the hospital. You wouldn't do that. You'd be in an ambulance. You'd be like 911. You'd be, you'd be rushed. That's what this is. This is something that God is saying. It's not about your worth. It's about my provision. It's not about your goodness. It's about my righteousness. You acknowledge, we acknowledge our sinfulness. Every single one of us in this room. 
are sinful. And we acknowledge that and we come to the table to celebrate God's forgiveness. To celebrate what he accomplished. I want you to know this morning it was not nails that held Jesus to the cross. He said, I could summon 12 legions of angels. Just think of that. A legion's about 6,000. 12 times 6,000. That's more math than I can do. And, 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 and the Bible, one angel, one night, killed 185,000 Syrians. You remember that story? One angel, one night, 185,000. 12 legions of angels? But it wasn't even the angels. You're talking about God in the flesh, the I Am who spoke the heavens into existence. He could have come down anytime he wanted to. It was his love for you. It was his love for me that held him there. He literally had to fight, not coming down, but staying on. And he stayed on that cross because he was thinking about you. Think about that. It goes on in Matthew 26, and it says, When Jesus came to the place called Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved and distressed. And then they said to him, he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face praying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. This is an incredible portion of scripture. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. They've celebrated the Passover. They've celebrated and commemorated this historical event. For them, it was even bigger than for us the 4th of July. It was their Independence Day, and they remembered what God had done for them. But now Jesus is in the Garden, and he knows the real war that's going on. He understands the spiritual dynamic of what's going on. And he begins to get grieved to the point of death. And he says, Father, let this cup Pass from me. There's something representative in this cup that is grieving Jesus so much that the writer Luke says that his blood, his sweat rather, became his blood and began to run down his face. Luke is a doctor. Luke is a physician. Medical science tells us that when a person literally gets distressed to a point where they're literally dying, they're li- they are under so much stress, so much grief, so much anguish that it is literally crushing the life out of them that one of the last things that happens is the capillaries on the forehead and the scalp begin to burst and it flows in with the sweat glands and blood begins to come down like sweat on a person's face. And you say, what in the world? would cause this kind of physical reaction to the Son of God. And he says it right here. He says, Father, let this cup pass from me. The cup he's referring to was not the Passover cup that they had just eaten from. The cup that he's referring to is what is in the Old Testament referred to as the cup of God's wrath. The cup of sorrows. Isaiah puts it this way in Isaiah 51. Rouse yourself, rouse yourself. Arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling. You have drained to the dregs. Boy, you don't want this. You don't want this. The Bible talks that God has some sort of reservoir. It's called a cup, and it's a cup of anger. And when enough gets in that to where it's overflowing, something's going to break loose. For Jerusalem, they chided him, they tested him, they, uh, they committed spiritual adultery to him, they shunned him, they mocked him, they backslid from him, and he was patient and reaching out to them. And finally that cup got filled, and he said, that's it, you're drinking to the dregs, and he turned them over to their enemies. This darling of the world, this prosperous, rich, pompous little nation of Israel that was nothing and became one of the centerpieces of that whole region. All the world traded through and with Israel, and they were just so American. And we are in the exact same place where our blessings come to us because of God, because we sought God as a nation. And, 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 and now we're, we're at this point where we think we don't need Him. When I think of the carnality of this world, 
When I think of parents who brutally murder their children, you read stories of them drowning them in bathtubs or driving them into lakes or crazy things. When I think of just last night, I was watching Dateline, and it was a story of these, these two 14-year-old girls, 14-year-old girls that were in a triad relationship, and all of a sudden the two started not liking the one, and so they lured her out in the woods and stabbed her to death with kitchen knives. 14 years old, just stabbing another one to death. Cold-blooded, cold-calculating murderers. When I think of men, grown men, so barbaric that they can break into a school and take 12 and 13-year-old girls off into the jungle and say, we're going to sell them for $12 into the sex slave trade industry. Or we're going to sell them to be married to men three times their ages. The carnality, the, the, the brutality of this world, the abortion which is a global pandemic. Drug addiction, which is out of control, even right here in this area, in this community. Heroin is cheaper than beer. And kids are dying from it. People don't realize that. There's kids ODing all over the place. Think of the crime. Think of the lying. Think of all the things that goes on. And then I think about us as believers that are intoxicated with hedonism. We are so absorbed on our self-pleasure because we're Americans. And life is about what I can get out of it. I'm not living for heaven. I'm living for the next vacation. Isn't that the way we live? I read this book the other day. I, I heard about it and I wanted to read it. It's called Letters of a Sharpshooter. And it's about a boy, 17-year-old boy by the name of William Green, who came from Raymond. That's what it fascinated me about. He came from Raymond, New Hampshire, and he got into the military at 17 years, and because he had really good eyesight, he became a sharpshooter, and he fought in that war for three years. Most people died within months. He survived three years and went through that whole war. And in his letters, you know, to home, and he's telling him about battles and all this correspondence, and one of the things that really struck me is in the correspondence was the reference to the afterlife. His mother would say, now, Willie, don't do bad things. Don't go to the bars. Don't go to the brothels. Remember the afterlife. And he would write back and say things like, you know what, I'm not going to make bad decisions because I'm always conscious of the afterlife. See, back then there was something that people understood. This life was so transitional. This life was so temporary. This life was not the game. This life was just the warm-up. And they lived for a higher calling. They lived for the eternal, not just the temporal. And how things have changed, we're here in America, we don't even think about the eternal. We just think about this coming weekend. This weekend's coming to a close, we're already thinking, what's happening next weekend? What am I going to do? How am I, gonna, how am I going to have fun? That's hedonism. I live for my own pleasure. James is very brutal. James says, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with this world is hostility with God and whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Makes himself an enemy of God. And in light of this, this next scripture becomes all the more profound. In Isaiah, God says, Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, you who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord even your God, who contends for his people, behold, I have taken out of your hands the cup of reeling, the chalice of mine anger, and you will never drink it again. God is looking at a time when his plan of redemption would come into fulfillment that at the fullness of time, one would come, born of a woman, born under the law, who would be Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And in that garden, God took the cup of reeling, the cup of wrath, the cup of anger, out of the hands of the world and gave it to his son. And in the garden, Jesus begins to bust capillaries and begins to short out the holiness of God incarnate. Is thinking, I am going to drink in. I am going to ingest into myself not only the sin, not only your sin and my sin, but the wrath of God associated with that sin. 
And he's at the point of death and he cries out, my God, my God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. In other words, he's saying, God, in your omnipotence, in your all knowledge, if there's any other way that these human beings can be saved from eternal damnation and get granted eternal life without me having to drink of this cup, please create plan B. If Islam can do it, then let me not drink from this cup. If Buddhism can do it, don't let me drink from this cup. If Judaism can do it, don't let me drink from this cup. If anything can do it, don't let me drink from this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus drinks of the cup, and Jesus goes to the cross, and Jesus is hanging there on the cross. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a level of anguish and suffering that you and I will never understand. Forget about the physical pain that he felt in crucifixion. When God the Son said to God the Father, why have you forsaken me? Why is there a separation? Why is there a rift? Why have you left me? Because he had become the object of God's wrath as he drank from the cup. And then Paul says something really phenomenal in Corinthians. Paul says about this table. He says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body? And all of a sudden, Paul brings an illumination to this table that we partake, that we're going to partake of in just a minute. He says, hey, this cup, this cup, it's not the cup of Jacob. It's not the Passover cup. It's not the cup of reeling and wrath and anger. This is the cup of blessing. You see, there's two cups. There's a cup of anger and wrath, and there's a cup of blessing. Jesus drank of the cup of wrath so that you and I can drink of a cup of blessing. You know, I've never gone to a wine sampling but I understand in Napa Valley and in different places that they'll have wine sampling. I've seen them on TV, though. And I think it's the most hilarious thing ever. Because when I drink, I drink. When I used to drink, I drink. Obscene quantities. But you see these people, and they get this little glass. And they take their little wine and just... And then they hold it up to the sun, and they swirl it. And then they're like... And then they just barely wet their lips. Just, oh, marvelous Chardonnay. <laughs> Dude, I used to do the 99 cents Boone Farm. You know what I'm talking about? You remember that? Yeah, you're all like, yeah, I remember the Boone's Farm, right? 99 cents. Get you where you wanted to go. But they're over there going, mm, you know, wah, wah, wah. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath to the dregs. What does that mean? That means that in the fermenting process, when it began to ferment, the juice would become all cloudy. And then as it fermented, the cloudiness would begin to solidify and would settle down in the bottom of the vessel. At the bottom is where the dregs were. So when it says that Jesus drank the cup of wrath to the dregs, it meant that he didn't just, ooh, that's marvelous. He drank the thing empty. He drank it to the point of the bottom. He drank in the fullness of the wrath of God in himself so that we could inherit a kingdom, so that we could have something come inside of us that was not of us, that would become a compass to us and give us new life. And Paul the Apostle puts it this way in Ephesians. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But pastor, they always drank alcohol in the Old Testament. Oh, listen, I don't care how you want to cut that up. I don't care if you want to say they drank fermented wine. Maybe they did, but it was an abomination for a Jewish man to be drunk. It was an abomination. 
Don't get drunk with wine. That's dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. See, I got off Facebook because I got tired of seeing all these Christians talk about their booze parties. Quite frankly, that's exactly why I got off. Oh, here's this is what I'm drinking tonight, and this is what we're going to have, and this is our margarita. Listen, listen. And then, and, then, and, then, and then you come in for marriage counseling. And I always ask, oh, what part's alcohol playing? Oh, nothing. Oh, come on. Wasn't born yesterday. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He's not saying don't have a good time. He's not saying don't have fun. He's saying do it through the Spirit of God. God knows how to have a good time. Listen, I used to, get, I used to do drugs and get high. God is the most high. He knows how to really get you high in the Spirit. He says in Ezekiel, I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statues and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You see, God wants us drunk in his spirit. God wants us intoxicated with his love for us that he went through what he went through because of you and because of me. And I don't know about you, but I really want God to start doing new things in my life. I want God to start doing new things in new life. And he says, come to the table. It's a table of blessing. The reason I can take this cup uncondemned. Listen, I might have done horrific things this week. I might have done bad things this week. But I can come because it's not about me. It's about what he did. He drank the cup of wrath so that I can drink this cup of blessing. And that I can be drunk on his love for me. That this God who created us is crazy in love with us. He's wild about you. When you went to bed last night and put your head on a pillow, he just kind of dr- leaned over at heaven and just went, aww. <laughs> Remember how you do that? You just sit there and watch your kids breathe. Aww. And then they got old enough to start talking. It wasn't as fun anymore. <laughs> just, ki- just kidding. Just kidding. We had um, men's group Tuesday night. And uh, Steve Black started showing a film about those five missionaries that were killed in the Amazon by those Indians. They were martyred. And one of the sons of the missionaries was talking about sacrifice. And we don't like that word sacrifice. Maybe I sacrifice some money in an offering. Uh, Maybe I sacrifice time because I'm going to come into the church and do a ministry. Maybe I sacrifice my pride because I'm going to talk to somebody about Jesus. And we don't like that idea of sacrifice, but he said something that absolutely put it in a different perspective. He said, it's not sacrifice when it's investment. Sacrifice means I give it and it's gone. And you and I never do that. We never do that. Jesus said, you can't even give a cup of cold water without getting a prophet's reward. We never sacrifice, we invest. We invest in the next life. To the degree that we enjoy the next life is to the degree that we live in this life. And that's why maybe we need to stop thinking so much about our pleasure and what's the next thing that we can do to have fun and maybe we need to think about what's the next investment I can make because when I make investments over there, Those are investments for eternity. Those are investments where thieves cannot break in and steal. Moths will never destroy. And they'll never rust or corrode. Those are eternal investments. And I don't know about you, but I've been making investments over there because I kind of like the idea of deferred gratification. Deny myself some things here so that I'll have bigger and better things over there. Be drunk in the Spirit of God. We're going to do something different this morning. Bill, if it's okay, I think I'll just sing with this lapel mic, if that... I know you didn't mix it, but you're so wonderful. I love you, man. Jesus sat down with his disciples and he said, take all of you. Take 
all of you. Peter, you're such a bonehead. But I want you to come ahead and partake it. Thomas, you're so fearful. You wouldn't believe a car if it ran you over. But I want you to come and partake. Matthew, you're a tax gatherer. You must have come from Massachusetts. <laughs> Judas, you're a devil. I want you to all take. And this morning, Jesus says the same thing to us. Not that anyone here is a devil, but he'll say, you know, you've got an anger problem. You know, you're dealing with pride. You know, you're lying in this situation. You're not being honest. You know, you're ruining relationships over there. You know, you're hoarding your money and you're not trusting me. And he says, I want all of you to come to the table. And so we're not going to have servers today. We're just going to let you come when you feel ready. I want you to just come and get the elements and then just go back to your chair or in the corner or wherever and just take them between you and the Lord this morning. This is, this is really a personal thing this morning. Jesus, we just thank you so much. We will never understand the depth of your love for us. We'll never understand just what you took from us. And then in turn, what you give us. You drank of the cup of wrath so that we could drink from a cup of blessings. We love you, Lord. Father, just lift our eyes from the temporal things of this world and help us to look to you. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Father, I just pray for this congregation that you would bless, that you would anoint, that you would do something special in their lives this week as they begin the 40-day journey again. Lord, I pray that you would just break out and that you would pour forth abundant grace, that you'd pour out mercy, that you'd pour out anointing of your Holy Spirit, that as our minds drift heavenward and as we just contemplate the great things that you've accomplished for us, that we would become intoxicated with you, Lord. That we would just be taken with your love for us. That we'd be raptured out of the elemental things of our circumstances and just held in your hands. We love you, Jesus. And in your name, we pray all of these things. And everyone said together, amen and amen.